I have a title this morning, and it's called Abandon the Accursed Thing. Abandon the Accursed Thing, or get rid of the cursed thing in your life. Amen? And um, we had, thank you so much, um, uh, uh, Faith Ministries, you supported the Christian Medical Fellowship Camp that was last week. We had 340 uh, uh, medical students there, 40 from outside of Zimbabwe, 18 gave their life to the Lord. One eight Amen. gave their life to the Lord. And, um, and the, the theme of that uh, conference was um, after God's own heart. And these young men and women that were really hungrily pursuing God. And uh, Acts chapter 13 was the theme when he spoke about how God said of David that he was a man after my own heart. And um, one of the prophetic things that was said there was that God wanted to transplant, you know it's a medical conference so they have medical language, that he wanted to transplant hearts and remove hearts of stone in accordance with Ezekiel chapter 36 and make them into hearts of flesh. But what was really, really important there to understand is that God say, is the one who says he will give the heart. And he says, and he will cause you to obey his statutes. And I'm just saying that here today for anyone that is struggling with the power to overcome something in their lives. That your job is to do a certain part, but it is God's job to do the part of changing and enabling you to have victory. Amen? So it says, um, abandon the accursed thing. And there's been a great call. I, I was listening to, to Pastor Shingi the last few weeks talking about grace. I'm part through the message uh, from Dr. Marwisa last week talking about the nature of God. And, and, but there is a call upon our lives to live a consecrated lifestyle. God is now done with a general Christianity where everybody just has a general type of Christianity. He's calling now for a called out, a separated out Christianity where you, for specific assignments that God has called you to, you have to live a certain way for you to attain those things. Amen? Amen. The, there is a prescription for every person. It says in, 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 in uh, uh, Romans chapter 12, it says... Do not be conformed to the standards of this world, right? But be renewed in your mind that you may know what is the good, the perfect, and pleasing will of God. And we spoke about it before here and said this might just be talking about one thing, the will of God, but this could also be talking about the graduated wills of God, that there is a good will of God. If I just say good morning to you, that's the will of God that I'm polite, that I'm respectful, right? There's a pleasing will. If I said I'm just going to give someone $10 here, that's pleasing to God. But there's also a perfect will of God, which is what I was created for, that I must fulfill in my lifetime and that I'm uniquely coded for. Amen? That's the perfect will of God. And so when you say to someone, God bless you, it's not that you are... God, see, our, whatever we are lacking in our lives that God has already promised is not because God is thinking about what to do for you. God has already decided what is going to happen or what should happen in your life. And to the degree that you cooperate with his agenda, those things manifest, but they are yours all the time. They were always yours and they will always be yours. And at any time of your choosing to cooperate with the agenda of God, they will manifest in your life. So when you say to someone, God bless you, it's a prayer that you're saying, I pray that God would give you the grace to cooperate with his agenda on your life so that his glory would manifest upon your life. That's God bless you. Amen. Amen. So when we say, Ishe Komporera, Zimbabwe, what we are saying is God cause a grace to come upon Zimbabwe that enables Zimbabwe to cooperate with the agenda of God so that the promises of God for Zimbabwe would be made manifest. Are we together there? So God wants us to live a life that is specific where we have reached a point where we are getting clear instructions from God. And curse, remove the accursed thing is that there's some things that are in our lives. Pastor Shingi put them like the bone in your mouth. 
There are some things that when we, see, when you consecrate yourself, it is a separation that is not really asked of everyone else. It's asked for a person or a grouping that shows your committedness to uh, uh, the thing that you must achieve. So you find athletes consecrate themselves. Sprinters don't smoke. Sprinters don't drink alcohol. Sprinters eat chicken breast and, uh, and lettuce. Are you with me? It's a separated lifestyle that not every one of us has been called to, but because they want to achieve something. And God says, come out of their midst and come out and be separate. We can't be blended Christians anymore. Otherwise, we are not going to, to win the race. We can't live generally anymore. So each one of us needs to be inquiring for, of the Lord what is the requirement for me, my consecration. You see, when you fast, that's a consecration. You are taking yourself apart from what everyone else is involved in to show your seriousness to God about the thing that you're asking of him. Amen? That's a consecration. And God said, get rid of the thing that is standing between your destiny and I, the thing that so, uh, uh, it says, the sin that so easily entangles. And I wish I could read all of Joshua chapter 6 and Joshua chapter 7, but I'll read chapter 7. I just want to paraphrase for you what happens. In Joshua, the children of Israel now are getting into the promised land, and God has promised them that they will consume cities city by city as they go into the promised land. And he says to them, though Jericho is fortified, I want to give you a strategy for getting Jer to destroy the walls of Jericho. And he says that I want you to go each day once round the, the, the walls. And then on the, sixth, on the seventh day, I want you to go around seven times. Right? Now you must understand this. God is coming to a place with us where he's going to give very specific instructions. Amen. Amen. The economy in Zimbabwe, the circumstances that we are in, I told you already that you are not going to be consumed. I told you already that if you believe God, you are going to hold something going through the whirlwind and God is going to strengthen you while you're in the whirlwind. He's going to enable you to make forward steps even in the whirlwind and then one day you'll come out and you'll find yourself surprisingly holding more in your hands than when you went in. This is the doing of God. That's why we were given all those words. That's why we we're given all those promises. Though the promises of God be many, yet in Christ Jesus, they are yes and amen. The word of God is true. It's infallible. Amen. So these guys are given these very clear instructions. And then on the last days that the, the, the priests are supposed to make a long drawn out call with the trumpet. And it says when you do that, the people must then follow suit with a loud shout. And then when they shout that the walls are going to crumble. And each man, the position that you're standing in is how you're going to advance in. And that is your territory. Amen. And then God says, the instructions are not yet finished. Once you are in, I want all the items of gold and silver to be taken into the church treasury, into the treasury of Israel. It says, but everything else, everything else, I want it to be destroyed and burned with fire. Now, God sounds drastic in the Old Testament because it says, kill every woman. Kill every child, kill everyone that's on the breast, every animal, kill every dog, cow, sheep, everything. God is saying that this nation, for my own purposes, their culture and conduct must not survive in any way. None of that, I want their culture completely annihilated. I want their books, their libraries, I want everything burnt with fire. That's the book of Joshua chapter 6. Amen? Amen. So they have this resounding victory over Jericho. And now the next city has to be taken. And you and I have our next city to take now. Never mind the victories that we have had in the past. There's another city because with God, it says there is more ground yet to be taken. Amen? A window of opportunity, the Bible sometimes calls it. And there's another city called Ai, A-I. 
to be taken. And we come to Joshua chapter 7. And in Joshua chapter 7, the Bible says that they walk into the city of Ai. They, they make us military strategy. And they say God has given us such a resounding victory over Jericho, which had fortified walls. So the city of Ai, they estimate as a population of 12,000 people. And they said, we don't need everyone to come with us. Because the way God dealt with this, never expect God to deal with your next battle the way he dealt with your last battle. You must still inquire of God the battle strategy for the next battle. Amen. So they make the sin of assumption. They say the same way that we dealt with these guys is the way that we're going to deal with this. And they walk in there. They said, let's only take 3,000 men. And they take 3,000 men. And as soon as they get into the city, the, I, the people from I pounce on them. They pounce on them. They chase them. And they kill 36 of them. Now imagine people that just sang around the wall of a city and destroyed a whole nation. Now all of a sudden, they walk into 12,000 people, the, 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 the size of Glaudinia. They walk in there, and the army of God is destroyed. And 36 men are killed. And they are disheartened. They are disheartened. I want to ask you to reflect upon your life. Because we're going into the next stage now. That why... Do you struggle with victories in certain areas that seem smaller than areas that you've had victory in in the past? And Joshua goes before God and he's crying and said, God, you told us we were going to take over. You told us that we were going to, it's in your word. The promises of God are yes and amen. What has happened? And God says, don't cry before me. One of you has taken things that I told them not to take. And he said, it is because of those things, because I told you to completely destroy this city. But one of you has taken things and has hidden them. And that man was called Achan. And God says, I want you tomorrow to take all the tribes let them come one by one. And now, the point I want to make here is that you may think that you are involved in an individual sin. But its consequences are generational or community-wide. Amen? You may think that you are stealing a little bit of aid money for yourself. But the consequences are typhoid and cholera for God's people. Do you understand? You may think that you are just experimenting with substances. But the consequences are addiction and loss of revenue for a family and sometimes death. That's why God said, I want you to get rid of of every accursed thing and only keep what I tell you to keep is everything that you're keeping authorized by God. So the Bible says, where was I? Joshua. I'm open to the book of Judges. Let's go to uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 13. Get up, sanctify the people, sanctify yourselves tomorrow, because thus says the Lord, there is an accursed thing in your midst. O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. We were speaking about grace. And it is true that God does not deal with us according to what we deserve. But also understand that the same God asks for holiness and the right heart from us. And the level of progress that we make as Christians is dependent on the number of obstacles we are willing God to help us overcome. 
God will not give you a breakthrough beyond your ability to handle it. And so if you are stuck in some kind of accursedness that you won't give up, God cannot take you to the name, not because he doesn't love you, but he knows that if you put something that is heavy on a weak foundation, it will destroy the very thing you're building. Amen? That's why Paul said that I cry and I wish that all of you by now will be able to eat bones, but I'm still having to feed you milk. And God is saying that there's adults in his church that are still carrying feeding bottles. Because they won't give up certain things. And he says, the reason why you're failing to make significant progress is that in your midst, there's an accursed thing. So Joshua obeys God and he calls them now in the morning, verse 16, and he starts to make them in single file, one by one, until the Lord stops on this man, Achan, verse 18. Then he brought his household, man by man, and Achan, the son of Kami, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, and of the tribe of Judah. You understand that these things now have consequences more than just Achan himself. Because now they're asking you, when you are arrested, they don't just say, you're uh, Matthew. We are arresting Matthew. They say, Matthew who? Matthew was like, oh, from where? Now you're beginning to involve. Now my mother has to come. You never just go to prison by yourself. You don't. All your relatives now have to come and visit you. All your relatives have to come and bring you food. It's now affecting more than just yourself. Amen. And this is the responsibility when we are becoming consecrated to God that we must take with us. God says that I will give you a heart of flesh that will follow my statutes. But before God gives you the heart of flesh, you can't be like Achan. The Bible says now, Achan, now Joshua verse 19 said to Achan, My son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him and tell me now what you have done and do not hide it from me. Tell me now what you have done, and do not hide it from me. I want to just say this to you. If I lie that I wasn't at my house when you called, when I was there, it's a sin. I can settle that sin with God, just the two of us. And so, Lord, I'm sorry I, I wasn't quite honest. It didn't hurt anyone except breach my relationship with the Lord. There are some sins that have consequences beyond the environment where they have occurred. And I want you to reflect on the following in your life. If in your life there is sexual sin, understand that the consequences of that sin are beyond just yourself. And I'm talking here about premarital sex. I'm talking about pornography. I'm talking about adultery. I'm talking about strange, uh, unauthorized sex of any kind. This thing comes with soul ties. This thing comes with encroachment onto your soul. Because the Bible says, can a man unite Christ with a harlot. And you say, how do I unite Christ with a harlot? It says, because the Bible has said, when two sleep together, they become one flesh. And because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, according to God, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, when you unite your body with a prostitute, you're causing Christ to be united with the prostitute. That's why the sexual sin must be resolved. The financial sin must be resolved. Dishonest gain doesn't just end by being dishonest. And I'm telling you now, there's people that have lost homes because of the calculations of others. You're with me? 
the people that, that prowl for people who are just struggling to make some payments and go and make a ridiculously low offer so that you can just get them out of their situation, which they agreed to, but you know in your heart it was not a fair deal. Do not dispossess someone or some family of their inheritance. The financial sin must be restituted. You must repent of it and you must give back. Amen? Amen? The shedding of innocent blood. Now you say, how do I? Murder by itself is the shedding of innocent blood. But the, the people who, who, when you were drunk, you ran someone over. That was innocent blood, but you, you, you were able to, to discuss it out with the police. No. God wants you to come clean. Repent of that. It's blood sin. Abortion. Whether you carried it out yourself or whether you caused someone to carry it out or you financed. It's happening. There's abortions happening in Zimbabwe all the time. Right now. Cost 180 bucks. But that's a blood sin. I told you about disinheriting people. You know, land is so sacred to God. It must only leave the hands of its owner by an agreement. So you keep seeing this, colonialists didn't pay fair price. Then another cycle came, they were dispossessed of it. And it keeps going on until fair price is paid. If you're holding on to an asset that you didn't do fair transaction over, find a way of returning it. There's an accursed thing in your midst. Amen? And then it doesn't surprise the weakness of your progress because God is saying, how can you hold all night prayer meetings and renovate a house that you took from a widow that you could have just helped to get out of their debt situation, but instead you said, I'll offer you half of it and then... This is not acceptable for a consecrated lifestyle anymore. And God is talking to us. Now listen how Achan comes. I hope we have time to, to finish it. Verse 20, and Achan answered Joshua and he said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And this is what I have done. And I want you to mark four things. Number one, when I saw, write down, write down I saw. When I saw the spoils and the beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. Look how detailed his assessment was. He says, I coveted them. Write down number two, covet. Number three, I took them. Write down, take. And number four, and they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with silver, with the silver under it. Number four is to hide. I saw, I coveted, I took, and I hid. These are usually the steps to becoming entrenched in an accursed lifestyle. The Bible says that the, the eyes are the gate or the window of the soul. I saw was the first thing. Watch what your senses are permitting in. He says, I saw. Now, it doesn't just end at seeing. It's, I heard, I touched, I smelt. Whatever we permit our senses to linger over that is ungodly begins to grow roots and tentacles. It says the eyes are the windows of the soul. Now, you must understand that your soul the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, it's very difficult to separate from your spirit. We are human beings. We live in a body. 
We have a soul that is the seat of our intellect and our emotions, and we have a spirit that communes with God. But the Bible says that the only thing that has been known to be able to insinuate between spirit and soul is the word of God. Otherwise, you can't separate the two. If you contaminate the soul, you contaminate the spirit. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, for the word of God is sharper, is like a two-edged sword, sharp and able to separate between marrow and bone, the spirit and the soul, the actions and the intents of the heart, right? So if you allow your soul through the window that is the eye to be contaminated, you are very likely contaminating your spirit as well. And unless you are doing like Pastor Marisa was saying last week and dwelling in the word of God, there is no tool that is able to separate bone marrow from bone. The surgeons here know it. Dr. Mawera is here. You can't separate. There's a thing, the instrument they call a periosteal elevator. It can separate the outside of the bone. But you can't define a line between the bone and the bone marrow. Akuna instrument like that. Only the word of God is able to get in there. So if you are weak in the word and you're contaminating through the eyes, your soul, yeah. it's very likely that you'll be able to, to, unable to separate the two. Yeah. Amen? So the day of consecration requires that I censure the music that I listen to. That I censure the movies that I watch. That I censure the company that I keep. The jokes that I permit to be on my phone. Because God is saying, you know, there's an uh, the interesting uh, article in the American S Journal of Biological Psychology. And they're saying now that if you look at someone's iris, you can tell their personality. Yeah, yeah. They're saying this by the way the lines are drawn. They can tell an aggressive person. They can tell a kind person. Don't be fooled by this technology now when you go into new countries and they say look into the iris. They're not just getting in. They are getting gathering information. So before you know it, you'll be stopped from going. Someone will say you, you look like a murderer just from looking. <laughs> Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, a good man from the good that is stored in his heart brings out good, right? From the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. How do you store something in your heart? It says, guard your heart with all diligence, Proverbs chapter 4, because out of it are the issues of life. We are holding on and permitting certain stuff. I'm telling you, it's not. When we were growing up, we were watching Dynasty or Dallas. At that point, when J.R. would want to kiss Sue Ellen, we all used to turn our heads and look to the side, right? And my mother would switch off the, the TV and we'd be told to get out. Now, you could be having cell group with the pastors and people are kissing on TV. Because we've been desensitized. The soul is contaminated. The spirit is likewise. Amen. I want to repeat again. What you're watching is important. What you're listening to. Young people come into a group together and say, guys, this month, let's just do an exercise of what music we permit and what we don't. Because all its job and its goal is to contaminate your soul. Amen? Amen? Then he said, I coveted, which means I lusted. I spent more time than I should have fantasizing about it, imagining what it would be like. That's how to covet. You say, if I owned that car, what would it feel like? And the Bible teaches us that the, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life are the categories in which we sin. 
Amen? And so if you see something and you linger over it and you close your eyes and you meditate on it and you find yourself imagining what would, it would feel like if you owned it or if you had access to it, you're going down the slope. You're going down the slope. And then it's just a matter of time before you take Solomon speaking to his son, he says, my son, do not lust or fantasize about the adulterer. In Proverbs chapter 6, he says, don't look at her eyes and how formed her lips are. He says, don't. Because once you start coveting, you're going to take the next step, which is to, to take. Remember what I said, there's some sins that you can solve between you and God. There are some sins that are going to require you to go and give back or to go and give restitution. The Bible says in James chapter 5, confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. That scripture that we always quote that says, for the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Do you know what it had to do? It had to do with having confessed your sin to someone and have them pray for you, that prayer of that righteous man is what avails your cleansing. Amen? James chapter 5. Confess your sins. You must confess your sin, if possible, to the person that you have violated the most. Next, you must confess it to your accountability partner that he may pray for you that you would be healed. It's in the word of God. And you must, of course, confess your sin to God. It says, I took and then I hid. The basis of sin is unbelief. The character of sin is deception. The strength of sin is secrecy. The basis of sin is unbelief. If you are in a repetitive sin pattern, usually your faith about how wrong that thing is is low. <coughs> Tete Monica sent me a scripture once and a, 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 a clip once and he says, a person who keeps repeating the same sin has not had a glimpse of the intention of God upon their life. If you keep doing the same thing, you don't fully understand the things that God has planned to bless you with or the position that he wants to give you. Because if God would show you everything that he had planned for you, it would be easy for you to give up certain things. And if you couldn't give them up, you would certainly share them with someone. I said that when you confess, it's all, if you can't confess to the person, confess it to the next person that is most likely to be affected by it. So it's a good thing to go to, to, to your husband's brother or if they're a believer, your wife's sister and say, there's something that I, is just troubling me that I've done, but I'm not ready to share it with my wife yet. But when the time comes, I'd like you to say that I came to talk to you about it because I'd already started to attend to it. That's important. But Aiken says that I hid it. We're all very good at hiding our sin. The strength of sin is in secrecy. The Bible says that nothing is hidden before the Lord, before whom we shall give an account in Hebrews. Yeah? There's not, so when you're confessing, it's not that you're telling God something new. But you're simply saying to God that I admit that this thing is wrong. And I ask for your grace to help me to overcome this thing. And I'm confessing it to you, Father. I'm confessing it to the person I've damaged and I'm confessing it to my accountability partner so that you would help me to overcome this thing. But we cannot go forward with the accursed thing under our tent. I'm talking about it uh, for us as individuals. You know, it applies to a country.
very few countries can say sorry to the international community, but more importantly, to their own citizens. A journalist was killed. And, and, and they said, no, he, he, he wasn't killed. We'll give you footage that he came out of the embassy. We, be, be, because the spirit of God, the accursed thing, is in our midst. Imagine they could have just come. There was such an incident in the embassy. Unfortunately, it ended badly, not as we expected. This is what happened, and this is, and we're willing to face the consequences. Now they're going to face the consequences anyway. But the power of sin is in secrecy. I long for the day that I, a member of parliament, a president, a leader of a, of a, of a civic society, will say, Zimbabwe, we're so sorry that you lost value in your accounts, all of you. We're sorry. That wasn't right. We're so sorry that there is no medication in the public hospitals. There should be. We're sorry. Not to say it's the pharmacist's fault. It's the, we are sorry that this is happening. And people are dying. We're sorry. But God wants to help us. Because after that, Israel went back to Ai. Unfortunately, Achan had to be killed. His wife had to be stoned. His children had to be killed. Because what he thought was keeping a Babylonian garment for himself was going to have consequences on his children. We've got kids that are in conditions and situations because of parents. We've got siblings that are in situation because of their other siblings. But God today wants to help all of us. I want to read for you Ezekiel 36 and we're going to close. It's not... Please put up Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 26 up there. This is God speaking about Israel. Verse 24, I'll start. For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all countries and I'll bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. And for us, the sprinkling is by the word of God. It says, husbands, love your wives and present them spotless before the Lord by washing them with the sprinkling of the word. Remember that. So the word of God is what sprinkles us. And I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. And I will give you a new heart. This is God now. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will take out the heart of stone from out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you, I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I'll be your God. The Bible says 1 John 1 9, if you confess your sin, he is faithful. You must confess. But he is faithful to forgive your sin and to cleanse you. You heard him. I'll sprinkle water on you if you thought it was just the Old Testament. I'll sprinkle water on you and you'll be made clean. Family, the time and the season we are in requires us to live a consecrated life. 
Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. That same Jesus in Mark chapter 1, you see him waking up early to go and pray. He had a time to pray and a place to pray. I want to challenge every one of us. Just until 4 February. To set aside every morning. You see, when he says seek first the kingdom of God, you, you can pray at the end of the day. It's okay. There's no, there's no ritual. And I'm going to tell you now, there's a big difference if you speak to God before you speak to anyone. That's why Jesus, I believe, went first early in the morning. He rose while it was still dark, the Bible says. And pray. Daniel was prime minister, but he prayed three times a day. Esther was queen, but she fasted. And we have to have a fellowship in prayer, and we have to have a fellowship in the word. I want to invite you to praying at least an hour every day. At least one hour every day. Because consecration requires that we seek first the kingdom. I love watching the Discovery Channel. And I love to watch Ignition on cars. And I can watch it for three hours. And God said, would you pray for an hour? Because... Certainly the strength of my life is not on the History Channel. It's not. There's nothing that comes from there that goes with me. There's nothing from the classic car show that goes with me. Nothing. But the one that I've neglected is the one that goes with me. And we must consecrate ourselves if we are going to get victory in the things. God is giving us prescriptions. Amen? I want to ask that we stand. There's a big difference between God and demons. You know, demons possess you. Demons possess you and they cause you to do what they want, even against your will. God doesn't do that. God convicts. The Holy Spirit convicts. It just helps you that this is not right. This is not beneficial. This is going to cost you. This is going to delay your progress. That's the Holy Spirit. So if you let him, he will show you. But he will also help you in your weakness, the Bible says. He helps us in our weakness. I don't want anyone to feel condemned this morning. But I want you to feel convicted. At the medical camp, we... Everybody came up. The elders were in the front. Everybody came up and, and said what bone they wanted to spit. Just so that they would move forward with God. Yesterday, at the Threshing Floor Conference... People wrote on a piece of paper the thing that they wanted to and just said, this is their cursed thing that is under my tent in my camp. I want us to pray. I just want to ask everyone to, to bow your heads and ask everyone just to close your eyes. I want you if you are dealing with some accursed thing because I ask that you please bow your heads I just don't want anyone being self-conscious remember I spoke about dishonest gain financial sin I spoke about bloodshed I spoke about 
or maybe I didn't, dabbling in the occult. If you have ever dabbled in the spirit world, Vadzimu, Mashali, just any covenant that wasn't with God. There are sororities and brotherhoods that are not godly. God doesn't want you to make a covenant with anyone except Him and your life partner. So dabbling in the occult, bloodshed, financial fraud, the sexual sin. If you're here and you say, I, I have some accursed thing that I want to leave at the altar today. I just want you to raise your hand. Just see everyone bow down. It's the Spirit of God wants to help. Father, I lift up your children whose hands are outstretched to you. It is you who said, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Father, see these hands of confession that are outstretched to you. As they do their part by faith, now, Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would do your part by faith. That, Father, that you would edit out of their system, edit out of their bloodline, edit out of their consequence, edit out of their destiny, the accursed thing in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that in the area that they have struggled, you would cause them actually to become victors and helpers of others in the name of Jesus. Not by power, not by might, by the, by the Spirit of God and in the name of Jesus. Or I want you to see every hand and honor your word today in the name of Jesus. That they would walk free. That they would walk free. That they would walk free that you would take the accursed thing away from their midst, from under their camp, in the name of Jesus. And Father, because they're confessing it themselves, that they haven't had to be hunted out, Lord, I pray that the grace and mercy of God would help them to have victory and not to suffer the consequences of it any longer, in the name of Jesus. I bless you this morning, Lord. And I believe that you have heard our prayers. And these men, these women, these boys, these girls are receiving help from your throne. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.